are here with Liz Ann Saunders, Senior Vice President, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I've been following you for years now. Don't say um, how many. Okay, well. Okay. But you, I feel like, have been the lone female voice in this space. You yeah. have. Why? Um, I don't know. I, I feel like I, I, I have followed some, some pretty exceptional women. Uh, Abby Joseph Cohen, sure. uh, certainly paramount among them. I Mirror started in the receiver. business in the mid-1980s, and uh, certainly at that time there were um, many fewer women on, on Wall Street. It's still clearly a, a more male-dominated, broad industry, but I, I actually, I think it's always been an advantage to be a, a woman in this, this broader financial services industry, and I think even more today than has ever been the case in the past. I, I actually agree, because I think the ta the tables are turning in so many different areas. Let's talk big picture, though, okay. with the market right now. Record highs. What should investors be doing? You know, it's a tricky one, because this has been a bull market marked by just rampant skepticism and right. pessimism, really, uh, since just about a couple of months ago. I noticed maybe not quite a 180-degree turn, but and I'm not sure what the catalyst was to do it. But a couple of months ago, and I'm on the road every week at, at events speaking to individual investors, uh, many of whom are our clients, and there was a noticeable shift a couple of months ago where up until that point, for this entire bull market, when I would get to a Q&A session at an event at which I was speaking, all of the questions, with almost no exceptions, were dire negative What's the next shoe to drop? When is the world coming to an end? What's the next bubble to burst? Oh, really? um, why aren't you worried about fill in the blank? Yeah. And the, the shift occurred a couple of months ago. Again, I'm not so sure there was any specific catalyst that I can pick up. Maybe just exhaustion, right. uh, being pessimistic, and, <laughs> and finally coming around to, what do you know? It's a bull market. Um, is it tax policy, maybe, that's making people happy? Um, I think that that's maybe a, a small component of it, but I don't know that that is specifically what's tied to the, the market. I think the fact that the market has had so little volatility and such persistence mm -hmm. in its gains, but the fact that it's coming now on the basis of much stronger earnings growth and unbelievably strong global growth. All 45 OECD countries are growing. Two thirds right. of them are in accelerating growth. By the way, both of those things predated the election. So I've had the view for the past year that this latest move in the market, I don't want to call it just a rally, it's just an ongoing bull market, but this latest surge in the last year has much less to do with the election specifically, or even the prospects for fiscal policy, and more to do with the inflection points in earnings and global growth, both of which predated the uh, the election. Now, inflection points are something you talk about all the yes. time, so look for them. Yes. How do people find them? Well, it's tough, because if you think about an inflection point at the bottom, and, and the, the relationship between economic inflection points in the market is an important one. Right. Largely because the economic inflection points and the market reflection, uh, inflection points don't tend to correspond mm -hmm. time-wise. The market tends to sniff out the economic turning point and tends to move first. But by definition, at an economic inflection point, when things stop getting worse and start getting better, you think about that, that's the bottom of the V. At the bottom of the V, the data is at its worst. Right. Think about March of 2009, when the stock market took right. off. That was first quarter of 2009, if we want to think in quarterly terms. Look at any number of economic statistics at that point in time. Look what was happening to pay gro payroll growth, where the unemployment rate was, um, industrial production, you name it, fill in the blank. It was as awful. But the market sniffed out that it wasn't getting worse anymore and was going to start to get better. That's usually the launch point for the market. Get an investor to be enthusiastic when the economic data is as ugly as it gets. Conversely, of course, the same happens when everything is booming. When you're at that upside down V, everything feels great, which is typically when investors are most enthusiastic. But the market's going to sniff out the fact that it's not likely to get better anymore and the direction so is. So then based on the, who, you know, you've been talking to people that are starting to get a little bit more optimistic. Are we approaching an inflection point? Probably not yet. I would be more worried if the attitudinal measures of sentiment, which do suggest some excessive optimism or at least complacency, 
were matched by behavioral measures of investor sentiment. So if you look at any number of behavioral members, not least being something like fund flows, right. uh, that enthusiasm is that, that investors may be expressing in surveys is not anywhere near matched by what for the most part, they've been doing with their money. So it's kind of the, you know, the optimism is a mile wide, in, but an inch deep. Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we see even those attitudinal measures of sentiment move down very quickly with even a small crack yes. in the market. Yes. Uh, it tells you that there's not a lot of sort of stability in that optimism. Investors are very quick to say, you know, see, it's already over. Right, so are, are you seeing people done already for the year? Um, no. Uh, in fact, if anything, I think you're probably going to see uh, some chasing into year end, not just by individual investors, but also by institutional investors. Sure. Uh, this has been a better year for active managers because correlations have crashed, and I think that's an important shift this year relative to years past where it was sort of purely uh, playing field was was absolutely in favor of passive over active. Now I think the playing field is more level, which also may be why investors are feeling more enthusiastic because diversification matters again. Even their sort of active managers uh, are performing better this year. Right, it's not right. just the passive index oriented. Um, so I think, but, uh, but certainly any of those institutional investors that are uh, behind uh, their benchmarks or under the gun, I, I think you're going to see that classic uh, kind of window dressing into your end. So then, do you, I mean, does China bother you at all? Um, no, no. I, one of the things that concerns me about China is I think in theory they're doing the right thing in trying to morph their economy to be away from debt-driven investment growth more toward domestic consumption. So I think that's a laudable goal, but what they prove time and again is that when there's any dip in economic growth or in the market, they resort back to their right. tried and true, let's just you know ramp up debt in order to boost investment growth and kind of give that shot in the arm to economic growth. So that, that troubles me a little bit, but I'm not worried about any problems in China sort of taking the, the entire global right. market system or economic uh, system down. I worry from a geopolitics standpoint, on North Korea, uh, especially given this latest uh, ballistic missile uh, test that ostensibly could reach the U.S. I'm surprised that that's not had a little bit more of an impact on markets. It almost feels like we're numb to some things Well, lately, that's right? the complacency argument. Yeah. I do think that that is, is rampant as, as measured by any number of, of things. So it's, it's a bit troublesome. What it tells me, though, is that we, we're, I think we're at risk that if there is some sort of catalyst that gives us the, the long waited for 2 or 3% correction, that it could turn into something a little bit worse by virtue of the complacency, how much momentum and money has gone into these short vol, low volatility strategies that I, I do think that there is a risk of kind of a, a bigger shock to the system. I don't know if it's flash crash type mm. proportion, but something that results in a pullback in the market that percentage wise goes beyond what the fundamentals suggest would be appropriate. A, the next bear market I think is gonna be a more traditional bear market that comes when it sniffs out the next recession. And I think a recession is still a ways out. Well, that's comforting, I suppose. Does Bitcoin concern you at all? This whole I, I, mean, I don't understand it. I, yeah. I, I really don't. Uh, and then, I'm so, and so I, glad you said that because I don't either. I, I'm, I'm trying. Uh, and, I, and I, get, I get conceptually the benefits of blockchain technology. I, I don't necessarily understand the, the hype specifically around um, Bitcoin. You know, there's lots of competitors. Uh, Ethereum, from what I can understand, has better infrastructure, but for whatever reason, Bitcoin has kind of captured the, right. the mind and the heart of investors. Um, I, I don't know. What we have been saying to our investors is somewhat limited, but it's it at this stage, it doesn't have intrinsic value. It's not backed by anything. It, it does appear to be a speculative investment, even if it turns into the next internet. Right. Uh, but as a result of that speculative nature to it at this stage, sure, if you wanna, if you wanna play it, uh, if you see it as a diversifier, um, great, but don't invest any more money 
then you're willing to lose. Right. So Not that we think it's, it's your lotto. It's your gambling money. To, it's at, at this stage, yeah. and and that's with limited knowledge of what ultimately this could represent right. in our world. Well, you, Jamie Dimon, all the uh, no one knows. No one knows. Um, you were talking about complacency, and that's often a term used with women and investing. Um, this inertia. How do we get women more involved in this? Because the transfer of wealth from men to women is coming, and it's like trillions of dollars. Well, and it's our, we're already, we, we crossed, I think, either this year or last year, the 50% the mark, where mm -hmm. more than 50% of the wealth in the United States is controlled by women now. And that's a function of demographics, that we, we, we live longer. Um, mm -hmm. We're getting higher levels of education. There are more women in the country now than than men, and I'm a single parent. So I run my house. I well, I'm not a I'm a I'm a married parent, <laughs> but uh, and my husband was on Wall Street for nearly 20 years. But um, I I run our right. financial lives. So I would hope, God. <laughs> and I think that firms need to reflect that. Um, any any company in in our our business, broader financial services. I was at um, the Deal Book Conference a couple of weeks ago and. Uh, Larry Fink was speaking, and uh, he used the 55% measure for how much of the the wallet. He said the American wallet was controlled by women. That's that's a little higher than the numbers I'm aware of. Doesn't matter, right? It's still it's over 50%. He said, "Look, if 55% of the American wallet is controlled by women, we as a firm better have our employee base at least somewhat consistent with that bias in um, in in the world." And and I think there is. A lot of companies in the industry broadly are coming around to that realization. I think you're seeing it broader on Wall Street. I think you're seeing it at the advisor level. There's a lot more advisory firms that are women-owned, women-run, mm -hmm. dominated by uh, women. I think women, this is a generalization, but a lot of women investors like to work with right. women-owned firms or other women. Um, so I think the opportunities are uh, are extraordinary uh, right now for, for women in this because, business. Because, you know, and these are my words, not yours, but most advisors now are these, like, older white men. Yes. Um, these firms don't have huge training programs right. with people coming up right. the ranks anymore. Yeah. And the, like you said, many of these women are going to inherit this money, take it, and go. Yeah. So these, I gotta believe these. These firms, firms they 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 have to up their succession plans, right? Uh, which you know, Schwab is the biggest in the business of advisors that platform with us, custody their assets with us, and I just got back a couple of weeks ago from our huge impact conference, and one of the themes for the last several years that we are helping our advisors with is succession planning, and that uh, involves to a great degree more so recently than any other time in the recent past gender diversity in that succession mm -hmm. plan. For sure. And um, that makes great business sense. That's not just a nice to say so you can check the box, no, the diversity box, but it's a, uh, a must-do. But then it's also encouraging women to come into the field, yes. right? I mean, Wall Street's been vilified for so long. Mm -hmm. We have all these sexual harassment suits left and right every day, right? So, so there are a ton of men actually leaving, unfortunately, because they have to. So the opportunity is there. How do we get these women in? Well, I, I think some of it's just education, some of it's uh, word of mouth, some of it's what we do at the university level to encourage women to study these fields. I think there's also, I found, a misperception of the kind of background uh, in terms of your education that is necessary to come into this uh, field. I can't tell you how many times I sit down with a young person. As recently as just two weekends ago, uh, a young woman who's a, a, a student at Duke University that, that I know in, in our town, um, really, really bright girl, and she wants to come into the financial services world. And she said something that almost every young person I sit down to uh, says, which is, I don't love math. Uh, I'm not I good at numbers. I think there's this perception that we are just math geeks and number crunchers. Math wasn't my strong suit. If anything, it, if I, not that I think it would have mattered in taking it in college, but I feel like a degree in psychology would have served me better than, than economics. I think there, there is so much about, now maybe it's just me describing the position that I have, but 
uh, I think the, the understanding of markets or working with investors, understanding big picture financial planning, you don't necessarily need to be uh, a, a math geek. I find that interesting you say that because I think that's part of the problem with the current advisors. They didn't take psych classes or sociology <laughs> classes, right? So they don't know how to relate to women. And I say this generally, they don't know how to relate to millennials. Right. Right, so we have this whole group of people coming up the ranks. Someone has to service them. And they are both different. Very. Young and women. Right. Yeah. Very. So women. Women, I, I find, we want to do everything ourselves, right? Yes. And so many women really do want to learn how to yes. get, how to invest, how to get their money in. And that's where the inertia comes. It, people speak in uh, lingo. There's this Wall Street lingo that, it, and it makes them back away. How do, we how do we break that and get them in the door? Well, you know, speaking personally, the lingo thing is, is something I think any of us that are out there, whether it's um, you as a journalist or me as a strategist, I think we have to be consistently and persistently mindful of that mm -hmm. in a position as pseudo-educators of the, the outside world. And, you know, you and I were talking before the camera started rolling about the late, great Louis Rukeyser. And uh, um, I, I, for all intents and purposes, got my start in television uh, as, a, as a pundit on his uh, show. And the very first thing he said to me when I met him was, uh, he had asked me whether my parents were still alive. I said, yes. Uh, are they in the business? No, they're not financial people. He said, well, when you come out here in 15 minutes to do the interview with me, get them to understand what you're talking about. Mm. And that so resonated with me and has been the voice inside my head uh, for 31 years in this business. And I, I take it to heart every time I stand up in front of a room of investors or put pen to paper or fingers to a, right. a laptop and write or record a video or sit here with you. And I find that even more than three decades in this business, so I would I would argue that maybe I'm at the more sophisticated end of the spectrum. I'm so turned off listening to somebody whose number one goal is to sound like the smartest person yeah. in the room. Or if I read something where three paragraphs in, you can tell their goal is to have you think, boy, they could win a Pulitzer Prize right. for their prose. But if 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 I don't know what the topic is. I'm done. Yeah. We don't have time. We don't have patience. So get to the point. Keep it as simple as possible and make it interesting. I, I think one of the fascinating things about our business, and I would say this about what you do as well, is that the environment's always changing. Yeah. There's no monotony at all. No. Nope. Every day is different. Every day is different. I think that that's fascinating. But how do you, so, the, but what do you tell them? You know, women, like, I, I always joke that look around your laundry room at the product you're using on a day-to-day -day basis and why don't you own those stocks? And I did it one day, right? You're sitting there, I'm washing my kids' clothes with, I need Clorox bleach, these wearing Under Armour, there's Nike everywhere. Why don't we own these stocks? I mean, Peter Lynch, old school. Yep. Charles Schwab, uh, Schwab same way. Like, think this through. Is that what we do for them? Well, yes. I think that's a good start. But then there has to be that, that important second layer of, well, if it's so obvious and everybody's already had that same idea, then there's the value part of the, uh, the argument. But I think as a basis, uh, particularly if you as an investor want to do the individual company uh, yeah. selection stock picking thing, I think that's absolutely for some investors. That's kind of, you know, the, right. the Jim Cramer motto. Right. For some investors, that's the last thing they should be doing. And they should be taking a more lowercase p, passive um, approach to investing uh, if they don't have the time, the wherewithal, the energy, and, or the interest right. in, in, in picking individual stocks, especially if what it ends up resulting in is a completely undiversified portfolio. Right. So to say, well, I, I know these four companies and that's gonna represent my portfolio. Well, if it's four US large cap companies, that's not a diversified portfolio. Yeah. The good news is, is that there are so many sources for information and education right now, courtesy of the internet, courtesy of firms like ours that make it our mission to try to educate uh, investors. It is admittedly drinking from a fire hose, and it's, it's an art as much of a science in 
knowing what to, to turn on and what to turn off. Yeah. Uh, but with, with a little bit of, of effort, I think it, it can be done. Does the robo-advisory world help, hurt, bother I think you? It, no, it doesn't. Well, we're in it. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it helps. I think it, it meets not just a need. It's, there's this perception that it's purely there for uh, millennials that have just started out right. and they don't have the kind of asset base yet that would give them access to the, you know, the pros, to right. the big boys. Um, I, I just, I disagree with that. I think it, it, it fills a need that, that spans the net worth spectrum, it spans the age spectrum, uh, it's, I think, representative of a desire by many investors to take a quantitative approach to investing, mm -hmm. to try to take the emotion out, which is one of the more important things mm -hmm. when it comes to asset allocation, diversification, rebalancing. These tried and true strategies that we all know we're supposed to adopt in our own portfolios, right. sometimes emotions get in the way. Um, the, the fee structure is quite low. It's high tech, not necessarily high human touch. And, and that fits the needs and wants of a lot of investors. So I think it, it can cohabitate, certainly at a firm like ours, it, it cohabitates quite nicely within the broad you know, swath of things Because then the idea is have. eventually you can speak to humans and talk to humans and get some help. And it might even be a great way for women to start. Absolutely. Yep. And, it, and if, they're, if they're actually staying engaged with what's happening, it, it's a, so almost a mechanical way for investors to understand markets and learn how portfolio composition works and how rebalancing and diversification right. works. You mentioned um, being on Lou's show. You worked for Marty's Wag. Yeah. These men were mentors for mm -hmm. you. I mean, were, were there any women along the way? Because you worked with some of the greatest men in the financial business. Well, if you remember the, the early days of Wall Street Week, um, Bernadette Murphy and Mary mm -hmm. Farrell. Uh, there were, that's true. Uh, there actually. were incredible women from the get-go on that that show uh, that I uh, had the great pleasure of meeting. Uh, Barbara Marson from Gabelli, right? Um, Abby Joseph Cohen, who although was not a panelist, was I, I think appeared on the show possibly more than any other guest in the Goldman. history of that uh, <laughs> show. So it, it happens to be that the, the three most influential people in, in my 31 years in the business happen to be men because I worked for Marty. I got my start doing television with Louis Rukeyser, and then for the last 18 years, I've worked for Chuck Schwab. Right. You know, it doesn't get any better than that. Mm -hmm. They happen to be men, um, uh, but I've had, you know, phenomenal female influences in this business in, in my life as well. And do you now mentor, sponsor, you must? Yeah, so there, we actually, Schwab has a formal uh, mentoring program, and pretty consistently I've had at least one uh, mentee since we instituted a more formal program. Um, but I'm always willing to, uh, to chat with people um, at Schwab, particularly new, younger people starting in the business. Um, I, get, I, I, give, I give these interns a lot of credit. Um, I have several opportunities throughout the year to meet the interns that we have, typically in our Phoenix and Denver offices. And they're really young, enthusiastic people. And what I give them credit for is they're, they're perfectly willing to come up and say, would you mind taking a half hour if I, if could we set up awesome. a call? And I, I, I love it. I, and That's awesome. I always say absolutely. And I think they're a little taken aback by the fact that I say absolutely. I would love to, to chat with you. So the in, the informal opportunities to encourage young people. Uh, about this business, I'll take you know any time I have time. Yeah, that's pretty cool. All right, so before I let you go, what are some of the biggest mistakes that women make in investing? Um, not uh, not thinking they can do it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of just g handing it over in many cases to you know a husband, or even if they're putting their money with a financial advisor, which for many people makes a lot of sense versus trying to do it yourselves, not feeling that they, they have the ability to engage in, in the process. Um, so I think it's that fear factor more than anything else. Uh, Isn't it that, amazing? Yeah. I don't know why. And I, I know you're from Brooklyn. I'm from 
Garfield, New Jersey. We were raised tough. I only know I'm, tough I'm women. I'm Brooklyn, Jersey, Philly. Okay. So, <laughs> so I, you I got, got it all going on. <laughs> so and now Connecticut. <laughs> but, right. Which is a little softer, but yeah. it's okay. But, so I only know tough, strong women. Right. Like, so I don't, sometimes I can't wrap my head around it. Why, why do you think it, why are women held back? Some of it, I think, is a function of if, if, you, if you got married and you had kids, regardless of whether you were a stay-at-home mom or you were a working mom, if you were not in your career or for whatever other reason sort of engaged in finances, it, it, it sort of gets further and further away mm -hmm. if, if your husband is doing it or I, I, I don't know. And, and then I think as time goes on, being further d detached from it, it's, uh, it makes women or anybody that's not involved very trepidatious about how to start in that process. Because of the do, lingo and, again. And, and right. And it, 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 is, it is daunting. I think, you know, for, for you and I who've done this our whole lives, um, it seems natural. But I right. think for, for many people, it's, uh, it's not natural. So, but I'm guessing tons of beginner information on the site. People can go check it out. Absolutely. Okay. Schwab.com. And one, maybe not hidden secret, but something a lot of people don't realize is that, uh, to, to plug our own firm here, um, everything, all the research we put out, everything I write, every video that I do, and my, my colleagues in, in other strategy roles, is all on the public website. You do not have to be a Schwab client. You just oh, go on cool. Schwab.com. I can get access to my own stuff without even logging in, even as an employee, let alone as a and client. And actually, so. I'm going to plug you because everyone should go read the le the column you wrote about Marty Zweig. Oh, the uh, the uh, after he passed. Uh, it it's the number one most read thing I've ever written in my what? career of writing. Yes. Oh, so all the more everyone. And it's go called read. Reminiscences of Marty Zweig, after and the it's book? a take on Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, which was a book. He told me to read my first week in 1986 when I joined the How firm. How great is so. that? And everyone should go read that book, too, if you haven't. Yeah. It's awesome. Thank you so my much. My pleasure. Thanks for having oh, me. Terrific. Thank you.